That was Honey. Um, Honey uh, came from, uh, had some uh, checkered past, and so uh, she's very fearful of humans. The Guardian has had her about a year now, right? Yes. And he's done a lot of work with her. She was just, she would cower and just, she's come a long ways, but she still has ways to go. And I was trying to get her to come to me. He goes, yeah, she won't go to people that she doesn't know. So um, this is a little bit of a riff of what the first video that I shot of me just arriving. I'm going to move this a little bit off the side. Now, dogs are very aware of their surroundings, so any movement's going to attract attention. She got her head up, snapping around. So what I want her to do, a lot of times what we do is, and I talked about this a little bit in the video above, is we want to show a dog we're a good person, we're going to pet you. Well, anything your dog is doing when you pet is what you're specifically amplifying. Uh, you pet an excited dog, you make it more excited, aggressive, more aggressive, fearful, more fearful. Now, when they're puppies, they can't regulate their body heat. So they do sleep in a puppy pile and they lay across each other. So they do t associate touch with affection. So if you do notice her tail is tucked, she's hunched over. <laughs> she's breathing really heavy. Her ears are pinned back. Um, her pupils are dilated. Uh, sometimes they hold their breath. Their hackles are up. Usually that's more of arousal. But if you know, she's hunched over or trying to dart away, or we call it very efficient or movement, snapping her head around. I can tell she's got cortisol, the stress hormone in her blood, because that makes her very jumpy. When you have cortisol in your blood, it shuts down all non-essential features, so digestion and everything else. It prepares you for fight or flight. This helps you if you're about to get mugged or if you're a soldier or a police officer or something in a dangerous situation. But we're not designed to be in that heightened sense of alert for too long, and it can shred your in, just your insides emotionally, and it just uh, people with PTSD have rage issues and frustration. Dogs absolutely can have PTSD. So she's laying down, which is actually a really good indicator. Usually a dog will not sit or lie down if they're uncomfortable about things. Sadly, however, dogs that have been really abused sometimes will. I worked with Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye's passed on. I worked with Marvin Gaye's son, who's also named Marvin Gaye. And he, uh, he bought a, uh, a guard dog. And the trainer, also in uh, somewhere in Los Angeles, I won't say the name, punished and beat the dog to such an extent while I was training it, it would basically do that. And you could have a marching band watch by. It wouldn't engage at all. And so sometimes dogs are so fearful, they will lay down and just truly submit. Uh, but I'm just, the reason I mention all these things, the most common mistake people have with a fearful dog is they pet the dog and they'll reinforce it a little bit each time. What I'm gonna do in this video, I'm gonna see if I can coax Honey to come over here to get a treat. And I'm gonna do something similar to what I did in the video above, where I'm basically just gonna to toss a treat. All I want her to do at first is just lean forward to get it and then eventually take one step and then two steps and three steps. During this process, I'm not gonna encourage her. I'm gonna make the treats available. I'm going to avoid direct eye contact. I'm going to avoid big movements. And we want her to do it on her own speed and volition. So we'll, we'll see how the camera work goes. We're going to go back and forth, but that's okay. Uh, so if you want to uh, go ahead and show her, I'm going to toss the tree, kind of try to get it right between those two toys. So she checked in with me, or do you want me to come get this? Now check in with my guardian. Nobody's asked me to do anything. So on my own volition, because nobody's asking anything, I'm going to do it my own because I want to. And when I check in, is anybody going to come and grab me? Nobody over here? Okay, where's the treat? I can't quite see it, but I can definitely smell it because I'm a dog and I've got great nasal sensors. She's like, this is really weird. Normally somebody's trying to tell me to come and get the treat. And she's waiting for somebody to correct her. Ideally, you wouldn't want to be talking, but I want to have good footage and have you, guys, have you understand what's going on. But we're waiting for her to screw up the courage to come get the treat herself. And she can smell it there. She just can't, uh, for whatever reason, she's blocked. So if she backs up, she's saying, I'm not comfortable enough. So I'm going to offer another treat a little bit closer to her this time. Oops, that didn't go the way I wanted. Let's, there we go. That was close enough to her where she felt comfortable. Now, I call this uh, stealing second base. When she gets these treats, once she's sideways to you, you might notice that she's leaning away, like right there. She's trying to keep her back legs where they are. That's a good indicator the dog is uncomfortable. So we just keep practicing. So now she's interested, so let's offer another treat. Let's see if we can get her to take another step. Checking in, and anybody gonna try to do anything? Still hunched over, that stiff body language tells me that she's uncomfortable. But she's getting more comfortable because she's, oh, there we go, I definitely wanna reward that. She gave me a step without needing one. So she's checking me out, and these good things are happening to her as she approaches and nothing negative, and she's doing it on her own volition. And for one more, I probably could have given her a treat there. Now we had a little bit of a sound there, and that's okay, uh, but those sort of things happen. If a dog has cortisol in its blood, and it's any friendly sound could actually trip them off, like if we're lying uh, in line at a haunted house, 
and uh, somebody goes to get tickets, and they come back and tap us on the shoulder, we might jump and be like, what? Because we're scared, because we think that the guy with the chainsaw is gonna come and try to spook us. So we have cortisol in our blood there. So normally, she's never taken treats from people she doesn't know like this. She, uh, uh, so she, she, she has. But there you go. So that's the cortisol. Reluctant. Sure. Yeah. And so, he, so the cortisol, that little sound, the cortisol amplifies everything. You talk to soldiers, people in a bad situation, they say like, you know, a mouse would fart and you would hear it on heaven. Uh, so it's, for the dog, it's just gonna amplify all the negatives. So what we wanna do is just help her feel comfortable and confident. And again, she gets her approach, she doesn't have the lean. Her tail's still tucked in a way that I don't like, but she's sniffing the ground. If you're about to get mugged, you don't like look for loose change on the ground. You don't care what your hair looks like. So if you see a dog that's grooming itself, or uh, checking out surroundings, those are really good signs for a dog that has issues like honey is, which is really extreme fear and lack of confidence. There we go, so the very benign sound, but she was ready to twitch. So I, that's why I'm holding my hand here and I didn't move my hand after I let her have it. And what we wanted her to do is repeat the process. So now she went all the way back there, I'm gonna repeat this again. And when I do this, if you notice, I'm leaving my hand in place. A lot of times the dog come back and sniff it a second time, like right there. And I'm not trying to pet her. That's the social burden. We all think we have to pet the dog to make the dog think that we like him, that he likes us. Less hesitant, less hunching over. She's salivating. Drooling, which is good. So she's really, I have really good treats. These are chicken liver. When you're doing this, you need to have a very high value training treat. Um, I like chicken or beef liver. Chicken liver, I use the Tricky Trainer chicken liver flavor because, uh, and that's a little bit off for her. So I'm gonna put it down on the ground. Anything she's fearful of, give her an opportunity to sample on her own. And if she won't come to it, do the same principle of what we just did here, offer a treat. She comes towards, see how that tail, that, uh, how far tucked that tail is. So we'll see if we can get that tail to come out a little bit. You should see the tail kind of start coming not so much in between the legs and coming just hanging straight down. You're doing great, honey. I know these are tough for you. So even though she triggered all that, it's because she has all the cortisol in her blood. So again, we're just resetting. We're letting her come and get it. And that was just because she tapped the bag? She, that was her doing it herself. It's kind of like if you watch Good Will Hunting, Robin Williams talked about his wife in the movie farted and woke herself up and she blamed him. It's kind of <laughs> the same sort of thing right there. Now again, she's very hesitant, but she's... Her nose is helping her override some of those fears and the positive reinforcer is helping her feel good about it. So now even though the thing that spooked her is on the floor, she's engaging with it. Now I'm gonna talk off camera about ways to help your dog with these things, but I do something called counter conditioning. So I'm gonna just talk about it right now because it's kind of in line with this. And I'm just gonna keep on, I'm gonna wait for her to go away and then we'll repeat the process again. Uh, but for counter conditioning is basically, it's, it's by definition is you're countering the response from the dog. So right now, if she doesn't like, let me say she didn't like skateboards. So what we would do for counter conditioning is we would provide a positive reinforcer, something positive, something good that she likes. In this case, these meat treats. So what we would do is I would have, I would arrange to have somebody with a skateboard that is under my control. I would find out how far away that skateboard needs to be for her not to be twitchy. So my two tests, can I get the dog to sit and take a treat. If cortisol is in the blood, they won't take the treats. So the fact that she took these treats tells me that the cortisol is diminishing, so she, her digestive tract is activated somewhat. So the idea is we find a distance where she'll sit and so you can see the guy with the skateboard and she'll take the treat. Then I have the guy on the skateboard move very slowly. And that's awesome because I didn't offer her anything. She's doing this as a residual. This is what we love to see. This is the great thing about dogs, how quickly uh, they come and see that tail that we talked about earlier. That tail is almost is bending outward instead of coming inward. That's a wonderful thing, and she's doing it all on her own because we had a good positive experience and nobody pushed her buttons or forced her to do anything. So for the skateboard, what we would do is have her sit, and usually I take these treats and I smash them, so they're smashed like a pancake, and I let the dog nibble on it. Now I can move the dog's orientation by just moving the treat up and down to the side. So this way I can have the dog track and follow the skateboard. So what I would do is, let's say we have to have the skateboarder 25 feet away where she'll sit and take the treat while the skateboard moves very slowly, per 
par uh, perpendicular to her. That's okay. Um, and so this, uh, the first step is we have a guy going as slow as he can on the skateboard. We're smashing the treat and we're having her watch him. So while he's moving, the thing that she doesn't want to have happen, something good is happening. She's getting a treat. As soon as the treat's about to be done, then I go, I, I come up with a signal and the skateboarder freezes. He stops moving and no sounds and no movements. I pull out another treat and then I squeeze it. Let her come over here and let her look at the skateboard while she's nibbling on the treat. And we're doing this, make sure she, her eyes are looking at the skateboard. A lot of people do this and their dog's looking like this. Well, the dog's looking down. When you do this, make sure the dog is looking up at the skateboard. On my website, there's gonna be about one or two dogs below you, a dog, a golden doodle that attacked the TV that I use the same technique to stop the dog from reacting to the TV. I do it with skateboards, I do it with people driving birds and limes and all sorts of different stuff. Buses. Buses too. And make a it's list of the, all the, the things. It's the shock. It's the shh. Yeah, all that. Oh. And that comes from uh, when a lot of dogs warn, they make a hissing sound. So it's biologic. So that kind of mimics that sound. I'm guessing that's a little bit what's going on there. Uh, but it also moves around. It's got sounds. And there's also a million things going on. We have neighbors that play their music pretty loud nearby. That thumping of the bass is hard for the dog. So all these things contribute. And the cortisol's in her blood. And she's just on panic overload. So what we want to do is make a list of all the things that she's fearful of. And follow the process I'm going to talk about right now. And systematically deprogram her from the fear of that particular item. If we start checking these things off the list, then the bus doesn't make me nervous. The thumping the music doesn't make me nervous. The, the skateboards, this, that, People the other walking thing. behind People, you. People, that's, yeah. And so if you're in a sketchy neighborhood and your, your foot's up behind you, you feel the same sort of thing. But if you have cortisol in your blood, you're going to be paranoid about everything. And that's kind of, I think, what's going on with her. She's not paranoid, but she just thinks everything is the boogeyman. So what we want to do is find the distance where I can have the skateboard moving very slowly, perpendicular to her, where she'll take the treat and watch it. So again, come up with a system. So the guy with the skateboard or one of the stimulus, buses are going to be a little bit harder. You're going to, and I'll talk about that at the end of this, how you do this. But if it's a skateboard, it's something you can control the person, arrange to have the person. Don't try to do it randomly because that person's going to do things at times. And just like the accidental touch of the table, center scurrying away, we want to avoid as many of those things as possible. So, and you can actually spread that out and just put it down on the table there so you don't have to hold it. Okay, so basically, once I find the distance, 25 feet in this case, we're going to let the dog chew on the treat, and as soon as the, the treat is about to be gone, we come up with a signal, the skateboarder freezes. I pull out another treat, and we repeat, and this time we're going back and forth. Keep on doing that until you see that tail come out. She's instead of being hunched over, she's up. Her eyes aren't pupil, you know, pupils aren't dilated. She just doesn't seem tense. And then you have the guy start going faster, very progressively, very slowly, faster, until eventually he's going as fast as he can, and she's watching it, watching again the treat, and not hunched over and feels confident. Now the next step is you have him come one step closer and repeat the process, but he goes down to going very slow again. Now as you're, pro uh, as you're going through this, you can eventually speed it up and it pr uh, you can, your progression can be a little bit more advanced. But anytime the dog reacts, always take a step backwards. The whole point of this exercise, she can't react at all. If she reacts at all, we push too far, too fast. We want her to practice being calm around the stimulus the entire time at first at 25 yards, then 24, and at 25 yards, as slow to fast. And then we go to 24, slow to fast. Eventually, it's a point where it's like right here, and they're going, he's doing circles and, and wheelies and trucks, and well, I don't know any skateboard terms, but she's doing all this stuff around her, and she's like, whatever, because every time I hear the skateboard, something good is happening to me. And we went at a pace that I was able to adjust. So again, if it's buses, I did this with my sister's dog. Her dog freaked out at buses. We went to where the bus is, the bus station. And we find out when all the buses leave and we went there twice a day and just program all the buses coming back and forth and here and that. And we actually befriended one of the guys second day and went there and he was like, I can trigger that, that it's the uh, hydraulics. He goes, I can trigger that sound for you. And after doing this for a couple days, the dog buses come by, no problem. And then she focused on the other things. So make a list of all the things that Honey is fearful of, systematically deprogram it, that way, the rest of her life, she doesn't have to cower in fear. What dogs usually do is they have a fight or flight response. They want to run and attack it and run away from it. She has decided to flight, which is much better than the fight aspect of it. I've had a lot of herding breeds that want to bite the dog 
uh, the, the car's tires or attack and end up dying because, well, not any clients, but I've heard a lot of dogs who do that because they're chasing a car and they're going to lose that battle. They think they're doing the right thing. And that's overcoming genetics of a herding breed. This is all self, I say self-made. This is a result of negative experiences. So the more that we have these positive associations, the more that she starts to feel good about skateboards or birds or trucks or buses. After a while, when a bus comes by, she looks at it as a good thing. Now, the way that you transition to that, at first we deliver the reinforcer as the stimulus is happening. Once we get to the point, I'll use a skateboard again, once we get to the point where a skateboarder can do, do uh, ollies or whatever you want to call it around her and she's not reacting, then what we would do is we would have arranged to have a skateboarder come out of nowhere and the skateboarder goes, zooms by and then after that we give her the treat. So this is the transition. So now eventually skateboard appearing is almost like a command word that means I'm about to get a treat. And so now she looks forward to seeing the bus or the skateboard or the bird or whatever it is. Instead of fearing it and running away from it, it's an indicator of something that's good that's about to happen. Uh, kennel? I'd like to see you get her into that. There, there are treats in there. We'll do, okay, well, the kennel is, <laughs> uh, we're gonna work, we're gonna get her in the kennel, but this is gonna be a long process, and this video is probably already about 10 or 15 minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and end this video. We're gonna work on that. We're gonna talk about some stuff, we'll work on that. But if you go slow at the dog's pace and don't over encourage them, Make it available and they come and get it whenever they want. And it might be that just the quality of treat we're using. We'll talk, we'll figure that out. Um, but basically go slow, make that list and systematically deprogram. And I would also for this encounter, I would arrange to have guests come over and practice. I would normally recommend you would invite your neighbor who is not Mr. Cooperative with the base, but he is not gonna probably be the right candidate. We want people that you haven't seen for a while. Just go through your phone. Hey, I got this beautiful dog, Honey. She's got a great brindle. She had a really checkered past. She's fearful of new people. I'm looking for people who have a great energy and come by and help her learn that people are a good, positive thing. I thought of you. And I haven't seen you for a while. I got a six pack, why don't you come over? We'll drink some beer, watch a little basketball or whatever it is. And when we have a real guest come over, we feel the burden of, we wanna be a good host. Well. Incorporate them. People love helping dogs from bad backgrounds. I'm sure you have probably 20 or 30 people on your phone that would love to come over and have you help. And have, you can have the neighbors that see her out. Sketch. She's really sketchy. Well, the more people that she knows, the more confident she is. Confident people, when they have a, an obstacle, they brush it off. Insecure people, like, oh my God, my life is going down the tubes. We want to build up her confidence so she's able to be prepared for that. So I'd like to see if you can try to arrange to have two or more people come by, not together, once uh, each week, and more the better, but have these positive experiences. Now, so you can set her up for success by getting her a little exercise before, maybe take a little bit of a walk around the block, but I'd like to get to the point where she just, you have somebody come over, and she just walks right up to them, and that person gives them treats, and then pets her, because she likes them, she ex enjoys the experience, and wants to, the encounter. Uh, let's see if we can do one more uh, recall before she comes over. Oh, hold on one sec, it'll take a sec. Bye. Now you'll have ebbs and, ebbs and flow, so even though she's doing great, the next time she might not do it quite as well. So that's okay. Well, this beautiful girl is Honey, and we're gonna help rebuild her confidence. And if you have a dog that's fearful of sounds, these are some tips and tricks you can use to help your dog stop fearing them.